welcome all members of the public and members of the public watching on the live stream to this, this strategic and technical planning committee today, Monday the 4th of April, 2022. Now, this is a bit of a first in quite a number of respects for us today. I think, first of all, we've got a change of name. I don't know if you noticed that. Strategic and Technical Planning Committee. We've got a change of venue. Now, I know you're all familiar with the Council Chamber, but we haven't had our meetings in here. In fact, the other thing is it's a first because it's two years now, or over two years, since we had a face-to-face -face meeting. And I will say I'm pleased to be back here in the room to see you in the real, rather than just talking heads on a screen. So this is quite a, quite a, a special day as far as I'm concerned, and hopefully from your point of view. Can I remind you that when you're speaking, can you please speak directly into the microphone? The problem with this system is, I understand, if you turn away to, to talk to a side, you, the sound does go fairly quickly. So do speak into the microphone. And if you're not familiar, but it's the right hand button, the one with the little head and the, the speaking sign that there will show red when you press it. We've got several officers with us today. And uh, we've got uh, Phil Crowther, who's our legal business partner from Regulatory. We've got Mike Garrity, Head of Planning. We've got Elaine Tibble, Senior Democratic Services Officer. Sarah Hardy, Senior Planning Officer, Minerals and Waste. Felicity Hart, Minerals and Waste Planning Manager. Steve Savage, Transport Development Liaison Manager and Steve Wallace, who's the senior archeologist. So welcome to all of you and thank you for attending today. So moving on to the agenda, and I will say that the agenda, we're running exactly the order that's on your papers in front of you today. So item one, apologies, please, Elaine. Thank you, we have two apologies from councillors, Shane Bartlett and Mike Dyer. Thank you very much. Item two. Now, uh, we've got eight sets of minutes to confirm. Uh, they're listed there on the agenda and the dates, but I don't propose to sign them at this point. I will sign them if you approve them after the meeting. So are members happy to approve those minutes as listed on the agenda? I take that as unanimous, yes? Thank you very much indeed. And item three, declarations of interest. Has anybody got any declarations that they want to make at this stage in connection with uh, any items on the agenda today? If anything crops up during the debate, then please make it known. Item four, we've got some uh, representations from the public today. Uh, I just ask them now, do they wish to make their representations at this stage or would they prefer to wait until after the presentations from the officer? You'll wait till the presentation, after the presentation. That's fine, thank you very much indeed, thank you. Right, moving on to the substantive item. Yes, uh, sorry. Madam, uh, did you say you wanted to make yours now? I do apologize. I don't, I'll do it together with, at the same time, that's fine. Thank you very much. So both of you are going to do after the officers presented the piece. Thank you very much, just to clarify that. So moving on to the substantive item on the agenda, which is item five, and it's application number P stroke DCC stroke 2021 stroke 01597. Councillor Penfold. Could you put your mic on, please? Yeah. Yes, sorry, Chairman. It's not a declaration of interest as such, but some time ago, my son had a, a unit um, near there, so, but he hasn't anymore. It's just a declaration of interest. Thank you. Okay, that's fine. Thank you very much for that. Thank you. So it's, it's an application P stroke DCC stroke 2021 stroke 01597 and it concerns land southeast of Sunrise Business Park, north of the A350, 
Blanford Bypass, Blanford Forum. And uh, the presenting officer will be uh, Sarah Hardy. Hello, Sarah. And she's going to be assisted, if necessary, by Felicity Hart. So, Sarah, when you're ready, uh, I'll pass over to you, do your presentation in your, in your own time. Thank you very much. I just check that's okay. Yep. Okay, so the application um, is for the development of a waste management centre, um, as you say, to the north of Blanford. And the proposal comprises two main elements, really, which is a household recycling centre, which would serve Blanford and surrounding area and a transfer station which would serve the wider former North Dorset area. Um, the site itself, the site itself is north of Blanford, north east of the Sunrise Roundabout and just south of Sunrise Business Park. Cursor is not working very well. Um, and just to point out that the Wyatt Homes um, application that was referred to in the report is proposed to be uh, southeast of the site along the bypass and past the roundabout here, just for information. Um, this is the application boundary. Um, the, the main part of the application site is in the southwest, which is where the operational facility would be, and the boundary includes these two. Uh, tree belts that are existing around the edge of the field um, and these are within the red line. Um, it's proposed that the access would be from the A3 A350 here um, so a new junction would be created there um, and it's also proposed that there would be a contingency construction access it's called and that is um, an existing gateway on higher Shaftesbury Road and that would be used only in the event that the uh, main proposed access couldn't be constructed straight away for reasons of ecology, for example. I've just got a couple of um, images of the site currently. Um, this is um, a view from just inside the main access gate where the access would be constructed. Um, you can see across to the northwest, across the, the, the site field here, and just here is the um, existing tree belt on the southeast boundary. From the Higher Shaftesbury Road, so looking the other way across the site, the first image is looking down towards the bypass with this hedgerow as the existing um, hedgerow along the bypass. And in the distance there is the uh, sort of southeasterly tree belt that I mentioned. And then the second photo is looking from the same place but looking towards the northeast. Um, and in the, dis in the on the edge of the field there, you can see the other existing tree belt. Um, just to set a bit of the context, the site is in the Cranbourne Chase area of outstanding natural beauty, which is a key issue for the application. And the landscape character is described as um, one of rolling hills uh, with agricultural fields enclosed by hedgerows and, and woodland. I'll come back to that um, key issue later. Um, the site is allocated in the Bournemouth, um, Bournemouth Christchurch Pool and Dorset Waste Plan. Um, and this is, the, this is an extract from that plan, and the red line here shows the allocation boundary. The, site, the application site largely corresponds to that and is acceptable in principle in terms of the, the allocation. Um, the proposed facility is to replace the existing Blanford Waste, Ma Waste Management Centre, which is um, on Holland's Way Industrial Estate, and the need for that replacement to manage increasing quantities of waste and to provide a modern facility was identified through the waste plan um, which was adopted in 2019 and some of the reasons that that need was identified was because the existing site is currently very small about half a hectare um, the layout and design of it is inadequate for uh, the numbers of visitors and the waste managed um, there's no space there for the separation of the public and um, operational vehicles and that can lead to 
queuing traffic and also site closures when the containers need to be emptied, um, meaning also that the, the refuse collection vehicles, which are the, the bin lorries that collect from the houses, can't um, access the site when they need to. Um, another issue with that site is that there's no fire suppression system um, and also their um, cross-contamination cross of the different waste streams occurs um, in the transfer building there. And there is also insecure tenure on that site. Um, so the replacement um, would handle increased quantities of waste from, um, from increased housing proposed in North Dorset um, and also increased visitor numbers and would um, enable a revised layout to be accommodated. Um, this obviously requires more space to be able to achieve that. Um, so there would be able to be this, the separation of the public and operational vehicles um, to improve safety and to also to provide a modern split level facility similar to some of the other newer facilities in the county. Um, and the site would also act as a contingency for, um, for waste from other areas of the county should um, an emergency arise and one of those have to close, for example. Um, so following a search for options to meet that need and a review of alternatives in and around Blandford, this site was allocated in the waste plan. Um, just when we get onto the next slide, you'll see this is the red line. We can see the outline is slightly different to the allocation in, in this area. Um, so the application site itself is three and a half hectares. As I said, the operational area can be seen down here. This is the um, proposed site layout. Existing tree belts here, which would be managed and strengthened um, due to their role in screening redevelopment. And then the proposed new access can be seen here with the internal road splitting to allow the separation of the public and operational vehicles. And just here, um, it's built in that there's a potential access to any potential future development on the site. Um, so this slide is a, is a zoom in, if you like, um, is the operational part of the facility. So the design is quite similar to the Broom Hills facility at Bridport. Um, and as I said, it's two sort of halves to the development. This bottom area here is the household recycling centre. Um, we've got public parking along there, and this would be the the canopy area of the household recycling centre covering the, the parked cars and the, the waste containers, um, and then a yard in the middle. Um, and the household recycling centre is, is um, obviously for the purpose of um, members of the public bringing their waste to the site, um, and that would include garden waste, electrical waste, um, and bulky items, recyclables, and, and those sorts of things. Um, and as I said, it would be split level, so people can drop their waste down into the sunken yard where the containers would be rather than having to climb up, up steps. Um, just at the end of this household recycling centre area, it's proposed that there would be a reuse building. Um, and this, it's proposed that will be a, a dedicated building um, for storing um, reusable items and also, also for people to browse them um, to, with the aim of, of um, moving waste up the hierarchy, if you like. Um, and there's a potential for a direct access to that, if I can find my cursor, um, along here at a future date. Just on the eastern side of the Household Recycling Centre, it's proposed there'd be an office building and a storage building for, for waste electrical equipment. Um, and then at the back of the site is the transfer facility. And this is for storage and, and bulking up of waste collected from the household to the curbside. Um, by the council from houses in North Dorset. Um, and that would include black bag waste, food waste, recyclables, and garden waste. Um, and the waste um, from the household recycling centre area, some of that would also go into the barn. Uh, this is um, referred to as a, a transfer barn. Um, and refuse collection vehicles would tip the, the waste um, into the different bays within that transfer building um, and then that the different types of, of waste um, are then put onto larger bulker vehicles to be transported onwards for, for final um, management. Um, just at the end of the transfer building here it's proposed there'd be a sprinkler tank um, to facilitate having the, the fire suppression system. 
Um, the household recycling centre proposed would be open seven days and the transfer station also seven days for the purposes of emptying containers, although um, bulk lorries wouldn't um, come to the site on Sunday. Um, and overall, the site would manage 30 to 35,000 tonnes per annum of waste and it um, would accommodate up to 200,000 visitors in the, in the household recycling centre part of it. Um, this is um, the landscaping plan. Um, the layout has been designed to um, incorporate fairly comprehensive landscaping um, scheme having regard to the, um, the location and, and the purposes of the A and B. Um, it's proposed that there would be creation of earth funding along this um, sort of southwesterly area and also this easterly area here, which would be planted with new native trees and shrubs. Um, you can see the, the sort of light, my cursor keeps shifting, the sort of light green along here, all that light green that wraps sort of all around the site, um, that's showing um, new woodland planting around, around the operational area um, and also along the bypass boundary there. Um, and that's proposed to be a mixed native species, including oak, teal, maple, rowan. Um, and providing sort of a varied structure to that and also adding biodiversity value. Um, it's proposed that the planting would include some larger, uh, larger nursery stock trees, as they're termed, and semi-mature trees as well, which are four um, or six metres respectively when planted, and they're shown by the orange and green sort of circles that are within that light green. Um, and they'd provide a, a sort of quicker effect, if you like. Um, and just along the access, this is the new access here, this, this um, sort of narrow, darker green strip, if you can see it very well, um, it's proposed there'd be new um, pre-grown hedge rows planted along there. Um, and then you've also got the, the dark green that's along, oh, it's a bit slow along the bypass there, that dark green, and then it goes along the, the boundary of Sun Rise Business Park as well. That's the existing boundary vegetation that is proposed would be enhanced and, and managed. Um, a detailed landscape and ecological management plan has, has been prepared um, and agreed by um, the A&B team and the landscape officer um, to ensure that the planting establishes and, and maintains an effective screen um, for the development in the A&B. Um, the tree belts that's proposed would be outside the operational area and ownership area, um, but obviously are in the red line and it proposed they'd be managed for a period of 25 years, um, which would be secured by condition. Um, and that condition also um, incorporates a five-yearly review of the landscape and ecological management plan. Um, so this is um, an artist's impression just to give, it just gives I put it in because I think it gives quite a good idea of what the layout could look like um, and it just gives an idea um, of what the facility will look like um, once the, the woodland is establishing quite well. Um, Sunrise Business Park is, is down here so you're looking at from a high level down into the site in this impression. Um, at the eastern end of the site um, you can see where the road splits here and then it come, the public vehicles would come down, curses too slow, would come down and around the, the circulation route there. Um, and then you've got the parking bays and the reuse centre at the end. You can see on the far side where, uh, where the HGV is that that's the route that the HGVs, the refuse collection vehicles would go to the back of the site towards the transfer building. Um, and then in the middle is the, the, the sunken yard, which is where the containers would be and would be moved um, into the building from. Um, so the refuse collection vehicles would enter the transfer barn, like I say, at that end through uh, roller shutter doors to deposit the waste collected from the houses. Um, and they would go in one at a time with the door shutting behind them. And there's space for up to 10 to queue if necessary. Um, Food collection vehicles would also go into that building um, and deposit waste um, straight onto refuse collection vehicles rather than it being deposited into onto the floor of the barn. 
um, for onwards daily transfer. Um, and then just at the end, you can see the, the sprinkler tank, um, which is opposed. Um, so this is another artist impression, which shows what the public area um, would look like. There's 21 parking bays proposed, and there's um, space on the road to accommodate 40 queuing cars. Um, and that canopy, which covers the, the parked cars and the, the waste containers, um, is 3.5 metres high. Um, so like I said, the containers are, are set down, so there's no need for people to climb steps, they're just depositing the waste down. Um, and then there's a row of trees in the middle of that, that public circulation route proposed, um, which is proposed would be um, the, the sort of larger, larger stock at about four metres when, the, when planted. Um, if you can see this one okay, this is um, a view of the main operational area from the southeast, which is where the operational vehicles were, would head in. Um, the furthest building to the left is the office, proposed office building, which would be about five metres, and then the storage building in the middle, and then the large building to the right is the transfer building. And then at the this end of the site, you can see um, attenuation ponds, which I didn't point out on the previous map, but they are just shown on the, this site layout here, three ponds that are proposed on the southern boundary, and you can see those on that section there. Um, and you can also see from the, the drawing that um, where the road is and that the site itself is, is higher than road level by about half a metre. Um, so this is a view of the, the proposed transfer barn and, and um, sprinkler tank from the central yard, as if you were stood with the, the Household Recycling Centre behind you. The transfer barn is proposed to be 11.45 metres high and the sprinkler tank 9 metres. Um, and then this is another section which shows a view if you were standing in the public parking area. Um, and just this sort of narrow line here is the canopy. And you can see the, tra the, the large transfer building behind. This is the north, um, sort of northwest edge of the site, the proposed site. And this area here is Sunrise Business Park. Um, new, the new glazed building is one of the highest on the business park. Um, this area currently, um, and then the proposed sprinkler tank would be about one and a half metres higher than the, the new glazed building, and the transfer barn would be about four metres higher. Um, so just coming to the, the main issues um, to look at with regard to the application, as I said, the, the site is in the um, Cranbourne Chase A and B, um, and the landscape and visual impacts on the A and B is a, a key consideration, um, as well as impacts on, on or potential impacts on groundwater and amenity, um, and archaeology and traffic impacts. Um, although the site is allocated, it's in the A and B, and the council has a, a statutory duty to have regard to the purpose of um, conserving and enhancing the, the natural beauty of the A and B. And the application is subject to paragraphs 176 and 1. 77 of the, the National Planning Policy Framework. Um, so for major developments to be permitted in the A and B, it should be demonstrated that there are exceptional circumstances and that the development would be in the public um, interest. Um, an assessment has been carried out in relation to the, the series of tests set out in the NPPF. Um, and it, there, it has been um, demonstrated that there is a clear need and a lack of alternatives and careful consideration has been given to effects on the landscape, which um, I'll go through now. Um, so views from the road and the Sunrise Roundabout area. So Sunrise Roundabout is here. This is the A350, and you've got Lidl just here off the picture. So the views from this area are quite important um, due to the, the number of, of viewers um, who would see the development from this Sort of part as opposed to from the countryside um, and given that the sort of fairly rural feel of the the road currently and this is a key area of concern for the the Cranbourne Chase A and B. Um, the buildings are set proposed to be set back about two-thirds of the way um, the transfer building sorry is proposed to be set about two-thirds of the way back in the field um, in order to reduce visual crowding of the roundabout um, 
This is um, a proposed um, view. You can see here like an impression of what the what the cancer, how you, how you could see the cancer barn from that area, um, with the proposed woodland planting starting to provide a screen um, if you're viewing from that lower level. But this um, this is a fairly leafy view, so it's sort of spring spring summer time. Um, but the AOMB does have an outstanding concern about the visual impact on this area and along the bypass. We consider that the development, although it's aligned with Sunrise Business Park, it would be a substantial and elevated end to that development. Um, so consideration um, has been given to whether the transfer building could be moved back in the site, which would be um, within the site allocated in the waste plan, but outside of land available. Um, and there would be issues it's understood with this in terms of drainage and also potentially a more significant visual impact from the north. Um, strengthening planting in this southwest area could help to ameliorate that impact also. Um, an option to relocate one of the ponds to the east um, was um, looked at, but again, that is outside of available land and it is also outside the allocation. Um, there is, it looks as if there's space here that it could be strengthened, um, but that is land that is being sort of reserved, if you like, for direct access to the reuse building in the future. So it's proposed that would be grass at the moment. Um, so the council's landscape architect has stated that they um, are satisfied um, that the development is designed to minimise impact of the proposal on the allocated site and the wider setting, but that buffer planting along the bypass. Um, would benefit from being deeper. And there's just a couple um, of other artist impressions of what, what the proposed views could look like. So at the top, you've got um, a similar sort of time frame in the short to medium term, um, but in the winter, and you can obviously see there um, quite the, the proposed transfer building is quite visible. Um, and then in the long term, um, there's extensive planting um, proposed that once matured in the sort of spring to summer time would um, provide screening if you were at that lower level but of, but in the winter you would still be able to see potentially the top of the, the transfer building and so it's concluded that there um, would be a residual adverse landscape and visual impact um, in relation to views from from the sort of bypass area resulting from the proposed um, location and height of the barn and that impact would be would be partially mitigated, but not completely mitigated by the screening. Um, this is the view from the north. So standing on this footpath up here, looking down, that's the existing view. And then that's the proposed, you can't see it very well, but the, the transfer building would be here. And you can see there, is it just above the other building in Sunrise Business Park? Um, so this is um, bypass, <laughs> and here is the, um, the gate from the bypass, which is where the proposed access would be. Um, you can see there that there's a slope, left my cursor, a slope goes up from the road level to the gate and the, and the field level. Um, and to create the new access would require the removal of the 50 metres of hedgerow in that location. So that would open up views into the site um, during the construction and in the, the short to medium term. Um, there's several layers of new planting proposed along the new access. So new hedgerow along both of the sides of the access as you go in, um, which would be the pre-grown hedge. So it's about a metre and a half when it goes in um, and then growing to three metres of um, and several of the larger trees um, proposed to be planted along there too, which would be about four metres when they go in. Um, in the long term, due to the proposed planting, the transfer barn and the household recycling centre wouldn't generally be visible to cars travelling um, westward. Um, but obviously as the vegetation is sparser in the winter, you may still be able to, to glimpse views of the upper parts. Um, but in the long term overall, the impact is considered acceptable. Um, so this plan shows the access that's proposed in, in more detail. 
um, and it's proposed that the access would be a left turning into the site and a left turning out also, um, so no right turn. Um, there's um, proposed to be the creation of a slip road with a deceleration lane as you go in, and then the red in the middle is the road markings um, to prevent cars from turning right. Um, obviously, it's worth noting that the site is for a replacement facility to traffic um, being moved from the town to the, the outskirts of the town. Um, but a, an increase of up to about 40% of visitors is planned for, although this would be um, sort of gradual, um, a gradual increase. In terms of construction traffic, that would be a period of about 15 months, um, a fairly low level at about 10 HGVs a day. Um, and when the site um, is, the, well, the site would accommodate um, 550 visitors per day on average. Um, and the transfer side of it um, would accommodate about 30 refuse collection vehicles a day, the majority arriving um, mid-morning and leaving mid-afternoon. Um, so on the highways map, as the local highways authority has confirmed they've got no objection in relation to highway safety or capacity. Um, this just shows the materials that are proposed. Um, so the buildings, um, it's proposed to be vertically clad with untreated timber uh, at the higher level. So this is actually a sandy colour when it's put on, um, or when it's first installed. Um, but this is non-reflective and darkened to this sort of dark grey colour with weathering after about five years, or three to five years. Um, and this um, is to give the appearance of agricultural um, buildings. Um, so in the bottom right is um, an existing barn in the area that has that sort of look. And then on the left is um, part of the, the transfer barn at Broom Hills and Bridport, which has used the same sort of material. Um, and the A and B um, uh, confirm that they're, they're happy with this material. So the A and B is also a um, international dark sky reserve. And the application was accompanied by a lighting assessment report. And just to sort of summarise what it is proposed in terms of lighting, so only areas of use um, it's proposed would be lit up. Um, and the lighting would be in three key areas. So the gated access, which is on that internal access road, the staff parking area, and then around the transfer building, uh, just the route around the transfer building. Um, so the lighting would only come on obviously within the hours, hours of darkness and within the opening hours, um, which are 7 a.m. till 7 p.m., um, although the site will, would generally close at 6 p.m. in the main. Um, the household recycling centre element would, would not be open during the hours of darkness, and it's proposed that all lighting would be motion triggered. Um, so around the, uh, the lock gates in the staff car park, it's proposed there would be bollards, um, the lighting would be a maximum of about a metre high and around the on the transfer barn sorry it would be wall mounted lights no more than four metres high um, and the AOMB dark skies advisor has has looked at the proposal um, and there is a condition proposed um, that requires a submission of a more detailed scheme um, the motion sensor lights, the on time at the moment, um, the maximum on time in the condition is um, 10 minutes, but the A and B Dark Skies Advisor do, did um, recommend or request that five minutes would be more appropriate. Um, but at this stage, the applicant has agreed to a maximum of 10 minutes due to operational requirements. Um, and they have said that the when the lighting scheme is the more detailed lighting scheme is prepared, they can look at the individual lights because it's possible that some may be able to be lower than that, but not all. Um, so just um, summarising on the, the effects on the A and B and landscape. So the landscape character um, wouldn't be conserved because um, the proposal results in the loss of part of an open field. And the character in the long term would be built form surrounded by woodland as opposed to that agricultural field. Um, but the proposed tree planting um, scheme would enhance the, the character in the long term. Um, so as I mentioned, in terms of mitigation, there's significant woodland planting proposed. 
um, which would in, and also that includes enhancement and management of existing sea belts and hedgerows. Um, it's considered that there would be a long-term residual landscape and visual impact from um, those when looking at the, the proposed development from the area by the roundabout. Um, and in terms of the visual impact created from the access, there would be a, a short to medium term impact from that as well. And the report also highlighted um, potential for cumulative landscape and visual impact should the Wyatt's um, application be permitted. Um, in terms of this proposal, though, there, it's considered that there are exceptional circumstances in the form of the clear need for the public facility and the lack of alternative sites in the location. Um, and so on balance, it is considered that the adverse effects from the A and B are outweighed by the significant and substantial public benefit. And so the proposal can be seen to be in conformity with paragraphs 176 and 177 of the NPPS. Um, so just going on to the other uh, main issue, um, the proposal includes a sustainable urban drainage system to manage surface water. Um, any surface water from the household recycling centre would drain down to those three ponds, which it is proposed would be fully lined and connected to each other so that surface water drains through them. And then um, it would be discharged from the site round about where the access is um, to the existing highway drain. And the water would then, the surface water would then infiltrate to the ground along the drain, which goes along the A350. Um, and part of the proposal is to reconstruct that highway drain to improve its capacity. Um, the AOMB team has recently raised a concern about the visual impact of that reconstruction work. Um, the applicant has, has so far responded saying that that would be done as quickly and sensitively as possible and the, the verge would be reinstated with topsoil and grass seeded. Um, so in terms of the wider potential for groundwater impact, this blue area here is source protection zone one, um, which is a groundwater protection zone designated by the Environment Agency. And in this case, it relates to the Wessex Water Black Lane um, extraction boreholes, which are an important drinking water resource. Um, a hydrogeological risk assessment was undertaken um, as further information um, for the application and to assess the risk to groundwater um, from the proposed discharge of surface water. And Wessex Water and the Environment Agency have confirmed that they have no objection to the proposal. Um, it was also brought to our attention that the source protection zone may change um, in, the, um, in the future. Modelling work is currently being undertaken on that groundwater source, which could result in the SPZ being redesignated. Um, so for that reason, the hydrogeological risk assessment looked at scenarios as to what would happen if, if that happened. Um, and the Environment Agency has just come back um, last week on the 31st confirming that they um, are happy with the, um, that the report adequately covers, covers that and they have no objection. Um, so the site is obviously within Blandford Town Council area, which back. Uh, with Pimpern Parish just adjoining the site there. Um, and the closest residential properties are on the other side of the bypass. We've got Kites Corner over here and Gurkha Road and Bracewell Close over here. Obviously, the site is adjacent to Sunrise Business Park also. And so consideration has been given to any potential effects on residential and also on, on the, the businesses. Um, plus any potential impact on the proposed Wyatt Homes proposal, which includes a school down here, and then, oh, sorry, here, and then housing just beyond here. Um, there's a number of measures to minimise amenity impact within the proposal. Um, so the, the waste is proposed to be deposited and stored in a building. Um, with one refuse collection vehicle going in at a time and fast um, closing roller shutter doors um, to be um, closed as the vehicle goes in and empties the waste. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, food waste vehicles would also go in in that method with the door closing behind them and would tip directly onto another, a larger refuse collection vehicle rather than food waste being stored there. Um, and, that, and that would 
leave the site daily. Um, also, tr any critical waste is to be removed daily. Um, and in terms of noise, it's proposed that vehicles, um, wherever possible, be fitted with noise reducing reverse and bleakers. Um, and compaction of containers would take place during the daytime hours um, rather than first thing in the morning, etc., to minimise impact. So, um, a number of conditions are proposed to secure an odour management plan and site management plan. Um, and there's specific conditions proposed relating to the daily transfer of waste. Um, sorting and unloading taking place within the building and doors remaining closed. Um, and due to the prevailing wind direction from the southwest and those proposed measures, um, it's considered that there wouldn't be an unacceptable amenity impact. So in terms of um, any potential impacts on heritage, this plan shows designated heritage assets that is the closest one to the site. To the north here is um, a scheduled monument, which is um, an enclosure at Pimpen Down. And then Pimpen itself, part of it is a conservation area, and these red stars are listed buildings within that conservation area. And to the east here is Langbourne House, which is a Grade C listed building. Um, but the, it's not considered that there would be any harm to the significance or setting of any of these designated heritage assets. Um, on the site itself, there is undesignated archaeology, um, which has been looked at, um, and that is in the form of evidence of a enclosed Iron Age farmstead with a field system. Um, and because that's on the site itself, the proposal would result in the loss of that, um, that archaeology, um, which equates to substantial harm in, in any GPS keep. Um, so an evaluation has been undertaken of that um, and a written scheme of investigation has been prepared and it's proposed should be conditioned. Um, and that details um, excavation that should be undertaken prior to construction of the facility. Um, and that would include full recording and publication of results um, in relation to that archaeology. And the council's archaeologist has confirmed the acceptability of recording that and the acceptability of that loss. And so having regard to the significance and, and scale of that loss of an undesignated heritage asset, um, alongside the need for the facility on, on the allocated site and the condition that's proposed, it's considered that that harm is justified and, and balanced. Um, so the recommendation is, is that planning permission is granted subject to the proposed conditions um, the report outlines that the proposal conforms with the policies of the Waste Plan and, and the North Dorset Local Plan. And as discussed earlier, it's considered that exceptional circumstances do exist. And it's considered that the public benefit of the proposal outweighs the identified adverse impact on the AOMB and that the proposal conforms with the NPPS. Um, just as a there's a couple of um, revisions proposed to conditions. I don't know if you want me to sort of go through. This is the lighting condition that was included in the report. It's just a, a tweak to the wording there. I have got those printed as well if it's easier to look at. Um, that's just to clarify the wording and the, and the purpose of, of that reducing that impact. And then there's also two a proposed amendment to condition 31 regarding the the sorting of waste within the transfer building, and then an additional proposed condition relating to the closing of the, the transfer building doors, so just to separate that out from, from condition 31, just to strengthen that and make it a bit clearer. Um, and that's the, the end of the presentation. Thank you very much, Sarah, for that presentation. Uh, yes, leave the recommendation on the screen if you could, please. Okay, thank you. Right, we've got, um, well now we've got three speakers this morning. Uh, one of which actually, uh, we were gonna have four, but one we've had the apologies because sadly, Gentleman's got uh, tested positive for COVID. So unfortunately, we've got 
uh, three instead of four. Um, what I'll do, I'll introduce them and then ask them to come up to this section here and sit by a microphone and then uh, you'll have three minutes uh, when you're ready to start, uh, switch the mic on, say your piece and mind. Okay, they'll do it that way. So in no particular order, but the first speaker I've got is Professor Philip Marfleet, who represents the Dorset Climate Hub. Is that correct? Oh, he's the one that's cancelled. <laughs> Gore Boyera. That's the second one this morning, because I didn't even introduce myself at the beginning of this. There was a hiccup. So I'm Councillor Robin Cook, by the way, for the benefit of those watching on the live stream. Um, OK, again, no particular order then. In that case, we've got Councillor Jennifer Morissetti, if I pronounced that correctly. And you're here um, uh, in, as a private individual, not as a councillor, and you're speaking on behalf of the Waste Team Lead for Dorset Climate Action Network and a trustee of Sustainable Dorset. Is that correct? Fine. If you'd like to come down here and set yourself ready, please. Thank you. Before you start, I've just had a query. Do we need to take the recommendation down? Will the, the people speak? Will the, those on the live stream be able to see who's speaking if we leave the recommendation up there? Do we know IT? Yep. Okay. Okay, fine. Right. Jennifer Morissetti, when you're ready, you'll have three minutes. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Jennifer Morissetti. I'm a trustee of Sustainable Dorset, and I lead the waste team of Dorset Climate Action Network, which is a network of community groups and individuals working together for a shared vision of a clean, green, and sustainable Dorset. I've also set up a fashion hub in North Dorset, rescuing textile waste from charity shops and repurposing it. Um, I have three points to make this morning, but firstly, I just wanted to say, having seen the presentation, I'm quite shocked by the enormity and ugliness of the proposed building at 11 metres high, which is taller than a 10 kilowatt wind turbine. Um, so, I would say that in the not too distant future, as a result of the projected reduction in waste, once the circular economy kicks in, this facility will be surplus to requirements. Secondly, surely the place to build a commercial waste facility is close to where the waste is being created, not on an area of outstanding natural beauty. Transporting waste from BCP and Purbeck will increase emissions and transportation costs. <coughs> Um, and thirdly, please stop the destruction of part of this AONB and the disturbance of this archaeological site by repairing and enhancing the existing facility. There are only 34 ANOBs as of 2018 in England, and they deserve our protection. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. And next, we've got uh, uh, Richard Burden, who represents the Cranbourne Chase AOMB. And if you'd like to come down, uh, Burden, if you can sit by a microphone, and when you're ready, switch on, and off you go. And my apologies for mixing you up at the beginning. Can we have the site plan put up on the, the screen? Will that make a difference to the live stream? If it's technically possible, we will, but we have to consider whether it interferes with the live stream to the uh, audience outside of the chamber. But we'll just check that for you. Thank you. Yeah, they'll have audio only. They won't be able to see us, but they'll have audio, which I think is sufficient together with that. So if everybody's happy with that arrangement, we'll, we'll do that. So give us a few moments while we get the the uh, site up on the screen. Thank you. OK, 
happy with that. That's fine. Okay. So when you're ready. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm the Principal Landscape and Planning Officer of Cranbourne Chase Area of Outstanding Natural Beauty. Uh, the first issue facing you today is the principle of developing a combined household recycling and waste management centre in one of the nation's finest landscapes. Uh, the AONB board has stated that an AONB, which has the highest level of protection in relation to conserving and enhancing landscape and scenic beauty, is not the place to create a waste management centre, as it fundamentally does not conserve and enhance natural beauty. It is for you, not the waste management plan, to decide whether the responses to the tests set out in NPPF paragraph 177 fully constitute both the exceptional circumstances and the public interest required by the NPPF. Secondly, recognising the position of the waste plan, the AONB team has sought to work actively with the applicant and the case officer to achieve a least intrusive solution. Planning policy guidance 041, landscape, is clear that any development in an AONB will need to be located and designed in a way that reflects its status as a landscape of the highest quality. I acknowledge that the reorientation of the scheme from the original plan is a significant improvement, but the visibility of a clearly industrial development from the vicinity of Sunrise Roundabout and in the views from the A350 arriving from the west is still considerable. The applicant says they are unable to move the development further to the northeast for drainage reasons. Uh, the site contours are clear on the second plan in your report, which is on the screen at the moment. The drainage pond nearest to the roundabout takes up space that could be used for more and more effective screening tree planting. The household recycling centre is elevated at about two and a half metres above ground level, and the canopy is a further three and a half metres above that. The proposed planting to screen the vehicles arriving at the HRC is on a relatively narrow slope up from the surface of the pond and only one tree thick. The AONB has consistently advised that relocating that pond to the east of the development would provide a larger tree planting space to achieve the least intrusive solution. The plans in the recently produced hydrogeological report demonstrate that levels and drains on the eastern side of the development are feasible for a relocated pond there. So a larger area of screen planting could be achieved near the roundabout. The AMB is also concerned that the development of that white land you see on the plan between the waste management centre and the northern and eastern tree belt. Perfect. Yep. Access from the spur off the entry, off the entry route from the waste management centre could impact adversely on those tree belts and could and should be explicitly considered in the cumulative impacts, which has not been the case. This committee meeting has come very quickly after that hydrogeological survey. The AMB partnership asks councillors to agree that further tree screen planting that can be rapidly established should be provided on the southwestern sector and to defer their final decision on the application until that has been organised. Thank you, Mr. Burden. Thank you very much. The next speaker is Gemma Clinton. And Gemma is here as the head of commercial waste and strategy at Dorset Council and one of the project sponsors. So Gemma, when you're ready, thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Dorset Council is one of the highest performing local authorities when it comes to waste in England. Last year, we hit 60% recycling and composting, which we're really, really proud of, but there is so much more we can do. In waste, the only real way you can reduce your environmental impact and improve your performance, and obviously make financial savings as well, is to actually push waste further up the waste hierarchy. So it's all about reducing your waste, reusing, and recycling. 
the existing site that we have at Blandford doesn't enable us to apply this waste hierarchy. The transfer barn is too small, um, and as such, there's often contamination of recycling from other waste streams. Waste needs to be kept very separate to maintain that quality and therefore the value of the material. So the new waste transfer barn will give us the space to effectively isolate the different waste streams and therefore enable us to recycle more. Furthermore, the existing household recycling centre in Blamford is completely insufficient. There's often long queues, the containers are accessed by steps, making them very um, difficult for residents to access, and there's insufficient space to provide good waste separation, in particular around reuse. Our new proposed site improves the customer experience significantly and will be accessible for all residents. It will enable residents to reduce, reuse and recycle their waste more effectively on site. And it will also be the first household recycling centre in Dorset to have a dedicated reuse shop that's undercover in a building, which will be a really fantastic local resource for residents. As a service, we've got a proven track record of building well-designed household recycling centres and waste management centres. And you, we've talked earlier about our Bridport site, and that scheme was pretty much what we've based this new development on. And that was an award-winning site. You've also heard this morning the lengths that we've gone to to try and mitigate any impacts of the development. But there's some also some other significant benefits too. For example, there will be significant biodiversity net gains through the creation of these new habitats. And not to mention, obviously, the ability for us to effectively apply the waste hierarchy as well. This site is absolutely in the public interest. It will provide us with the tools and infrastructure required to manage our waste further up the waste hierarchy. The sympathetic, sustainable design of this new facility has been future-proof within our limited budget and absolutely has the environment and the local community at its core. I strongly urge the committee to grant planning permission for this site. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gemma. Sarah, is there any response you'd like to what the speakers have said? Thank you, Chairman. Yes, I, I just have a quick comment on the uh, principle that was raised by a couple of speakers. Um, just for committee's awareness, the site has gone through a local plan process um, where the inspector would have considered issues of whether or not there was a case for the site to come forward. So there was quite a lot of evidence went into the preparation of that examination process and the site is allocated in, in the waste local plan. So we do actually have it as an allocation. That's not to say matters of detail have to be looked at now, but the principle has actually already been established through that plan and there is no fundamental change in policy or anything that's happened since that plan was adopted that would change that principle. Um, so really the focus isn't so much on whether or not the site should be suitable because in the, the need for it was established through that um, process. So, so really it's the matter of the detail before you, I would say, rather than the principle. So that's, I just wanted to make that point very clear for members. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mike, for making that clear uh, uh, to members and uh, the viewing public as well. So thank you. Sarah, is there anything you want to respond to that has been said other than what Mike said there? No? Okay, right, we'll go into, first of all, councillors' questions, and um, I'm going to do this slightly differently this time, now that we're back in the room. Um, it's not an original idea, because I've pinched it from one of our other members here, but I'm going to go round to each member in turn and ask them if they've got any questions. So everybody then has an opportunity to ask a question. Once we've done that, we can then move into debate. And if you can focus your questions at this stage on just the clarity for the presentation, uh, that would be helpful. So I'm going to go through, um, I'll call your name out. As we go forward in the debate, I could I just remind you to uh, state your name when we're in debate for the benefit of the viewing uh, public. 
Right, so on my list here, again, the order I've got is um, Councillor Dave Bolwell. Any questions, Councillor Bolwell? Thank you, Chair. No, excellent presentation and no questions. Thank you very much. Councillor Alex Brenton. Thank you, Chair. Councillor Brenton from um, North Purbeck. Uh, my question is, and, and this is a road I use quite a lot, I am not aware that there is any sort of footpath or uh, walkable way from the Sunrise Roundabout down the same side of the road and into the proposed waste transfer station um, and wonder whether or not that is likely to happen in the future? Is it a possibility or has it been completely rejected? I am concerned that there seems to be no pedestrian access for workers. I mean, there's a lot of people live the other side of the bypass and some of those will want to walk to work. To encourage them to get in the car to drive 200 yards seems a little bit silly. Um, I noticed there's possibility of cycle stands on site, but that's not Def desperately encouraging. So I would have liked to have seen more, um, if, if there was going to be any change or improvement pedestrian or cycle access to this site, or will there be a, an access in through the existing Sunrise Park so they could cycle in that way? Okay, well, I think that one probably is directed at highways uh, for Steve Savage, who's here representing highways. Yes, Steve? Um, the application doesn't suggest any pedestrian or cycle access to the site, as you've quite rightly noted, Councillor. It does mention that in the future, the, um, the yellow footbridge, which we've all seen across the bypass, which has never been utilised to uh, my knowledge, in the future, when the White Homes development immediately to the east comes forward, then there is the opportunity then for that particular footbridge to be utilised and for access to the site to be um, gained from there. But the principle you see before you, you're quite correct, there is no pedestrian access. The applicant is suggesting that they may provide some cycle parking for staff on site. Um, I think the, the safety answer here is there is no safe means of crossing the bypass and I don't think we'd really want to encourage that my experience of um, waste transfer stations and the like is that people do tend to put their rubbish in the cars and drive. They are unlikely to walk there. Um, that's all we know, Chair. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. This might come up further in the debate, possibly. Thank you. Councillor Kelvin Clayton. Thank you, Chair. Um, two very quick questions, hopefully. Um, first, in the conditions of acceptance, you refer to correlated colour temperature. Sorry, could you just explain what that means? As far as I'm aware, it's the colour warmth given by the, the, the bulbs, if you like. So there's different you know, brightness and heat levels. I'm not an expert on this, but it is the level of, of brightness and heat that it, or heat level that is given out from that light. So 3,000 is sort of higher, or the, the one that is proposed, and 2,700 would be the next sort of down from that. Lighting. Yeah, lighting, yeah. And secondly, if I can, I, I know you said there's a lack of alternative sites, and it's already been explained to us that the principle has already been granted. But just for clarity, have any other sites actually been sought or looked at? Um, do you mean at this present time, I assume? Yes. Yeah, because the, the waste plan process looked at in detail at sites on employment land and land around the bypass during that process. Um, the application has not looked at those again, but has looked at whether there is a potential to expand the site where it is, but the land around that is now, has now been developed. Um, they also looked at the site at Langton Lodge, which was also looked at in the waste plan process, and that is um, down at Black Lane. Um, 
but I don't believe that was looked at in great detail for the application because it had already been looked at at that earlier stage and there were other, other issues with that site which meant that it was discounted. Yeah, I think that, that actually was a fair question, Councillor Clayton, because but Mike Garrity did explain about the allocation. And I know from personal experience how long the both the waste and the minerals uh, strategy document was in the making and the various consultations that it went over many, many years. That was in forward. So there has been a lot of a lot of awfully detailed work about identifying and narrowing down these sites uh, for at least at least ten years, I would think, probably. Yeah. Yeah, the waste plan wasn't quite as long as that, um, but the, yeah, because the, the minerals plan started earlier than that. The waste plan work was probably probably over six or seven years, and then it was adopted in 2019. Yeah. Right. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Jean Dunseith. Jean. No questions, Chairman. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Sherry Jesperson. Thank you, Chair. Um, uh, Sherry Jesperson, Hillports and Upper Tarrant's Ward. Um, I've been following this um, development uh, in great detail because it borders on my ward. And in that context, I would just like to say thank you to Dorset Council officers who've made great efforts to keep local members and local parish councillors in the loop um, as this uh, planning application has wended its weary way through the process. So, so we have appreciated that, thank you. And as a consequence of that, of course, many of my questions are already answered. I do have a couple, though, if I may. And this is sort of a question, but it's the only way I can um, get it into the minutes. And it's a question, I guess, uh, principally for, for highways. The A350 and the C13 currently have an advisory one-way system for HGVs, and this is very important for um, the uh, management of local traffic. Um, obviously, a, uh, waste vehicles, when they're on their rounds, it doesn't apply to them because they have a round that they take, so that they're allowed to ignore the, uh, the uh, one-way system. But can I have assurance that um, this advisory one-way system, Dorset Council's advisory one-way system, will be observed by all the waste vehicles that are coming to and from this site, this facility, when, it, when they're not actually on their round? In other words, when they're coming in from Gillingham and Sherbourne and elsewhere, um, and that they won't, that they are classed as HGVs, they will be scooped up in that classification and that it will be observed by them um, when they're on their uh, uh, to, to the train to the site. Uh, that's my first question and all I want is yes. <laughs> Another one for highways, I think. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I'm sorry, Councillor Jesperson. Personally, I can't give you that assurance. I would have um, presumed it was an operational question to discuss with Dorset Waste and that operationally that they will continue their current practice. Uh, as a highway authority, uh, unfortunately, I'm not representing uh, a traffic management expert here at all. Um, it would be an operational issue as far as I'm aware. Thank you, Chair. Well, I've raised it. I hope that whoever's responsible for it, and I, 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 even as you were answering, I realised it wasn't you, Steve. I hope that whoever's operationally responsible for it has um, uh, logged that and will, and will give me that assurance because it is in, important for the local people. Mr Chairman, I do have another question, if I may, and it relates to the... Um, the, the management of the, or not the management, the replanting of the um, uh, landscaping in the, at the entrance to this site. Can I have assurance, um, can, can we absolutely be sure that the management of this um, landscaping is going to replace the um, 
bushes and the, the trees that we are removing to make the entrance, which is quite a big space, with planting that is compatible and similar to the planting that's there on the Blandford Bypass. I raise this because the planting on the Blandford Bypass is one of the most successful and lovely examples of landscape planting on a bypass. The, the drive up through that road is absolutely charming, really effective at any time of year. And it would be a great shame if by not paying enough attention to that, we should have a nasty gap in that where we might have planting, but it's not as colorful and as effective. So can I would, I'd quite like to put in the condition, if I may, if that's possible, uh, just an extra phrase that says that the, um, when this landscape scheme comes back to our landscape officers, they pay particular attention to the fact that it matches the really good land, the really good planting that's been there for the last 25 years. Um, and also, and that this is perhaps a matter for, de for debate, but I am concerned about the depth of the planting there in the context of the AOMB, but I'll, I'll leave that till the uh, discussion. But if I could just pop something in the condition that just make sure that the planting matches in as good as what we've got there. Thank you. Sarah, did you want to respond to that um, at this stage or as we go further into the discussion? Sorry, Chairman. Um, well, I guess it's a, we have some fairly detailed conditions that relate to the landscape and ecological management plans and they're subject to review and ongoing um, maintenance as well as part of that process. So that will, that will have gone through our own landscape colleagues to check that the details of that were, were acceptable. Um, so from that point of view, I'm, I'm assuming that the details are actually along the lines of what you're actually asking for, Councillor, because we've, we've, we've already got that plan in place um, as part of the proposal to ensure that that, that, is, that is agreed. Um, so I'm not entirely sure that we need to strengthen the conditions on that basis, but if there was a specific, specific point you wanted put in the condition, we could give consideration to that. So uh, I, I suppose it's a question over to you again, whether there was a particular point you wanted to be put into the condition. I'm not sure that there, I'm not sure that I'm able to give you a specific point. I guess you, you've sort of reassured me that that our landscape. It's just a, 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 to be aware of the particular charm and effectiveness of that stretch of planting, and it would be such a pity if we ruined it by not paying enough attention to to what's there already all the way along that stretch. So thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Mary Penfold. Chairman, <coughs> it really um, leads on from Councillor Justison's um, questions, and she's already asked the one that I was going to ask anyway, so that's been answered. Um, I was more, I was interested in the actual management plan for the trees. We've got the site management plan for the highway and the mud on the highway and things, but what is going to happen? Because obviously we've got trees being planted, how could someone give me a bit more information about how we're going to manage this? Thank you. Sarah? Uh, yes, yeah, so there's a landscape and ecological management plan. I've, I've just opened it to, to see if I could check your last point, which is 68 pages. It's pretty comprehensive. And that has gone through... Um, a detailed kind of reiteration as the application's been going on um, to address concerns that the AOMB team and our landscape officer had about, about that and about the content of it. That has now been agreed by those, those two um, people. The, the management plan um, is to cover a 25 year period and the condition that's proposed is that it would be reviewed every five years as well. Um, and that is really the detail of how that planting will take place and how it will be um, managed. So that, that's sort of a key document. Thank you. 
Uh, Councillor Belinda Rideout. Thank you, Chairman. Um, question for Sarah, or clarification. The proposal includes the installation of photovoltaic can't say it, voltaic panels on the reuse building and provision is also made for future installation of further panels on the other buildings and the HRC canopy. I'm just wondering why you, we can't bring all those panels together with this proposal in one hit. Um, and also, are there any other plans such as uh, rainwater harvesting for the site? Thank you. Um, rainwater harvesting, no, there isn't anything included in the proposal about that. In terms of the um, photovoltaic panels, the reason um, given about why they weren't going to um, include that in the proposal to be installed on the roof at this stage um, was that the additional steel that would be needed to support that installation weight wasn't going to be cost effective at this stage. And also there was concern about overshadowing of the panels by the parapet wall, I understand. Um, but the proposal does include the underground infrastructure to enable those panels to be installed, I believe, on the roof um, of the office, on the storage building and on the canopy in the future. But that would be subject to funding, I assume, and also subject to a separate planning commission, potentially. In other words, it has been taken into account within the report. I noted that, yes, yeah. So that's a, a fair question, thank you. Uh, Councillor David Took. Thank you, Chairman. Um, first of all, I just make a, a declaration of, of interest in the way in which I'm interested in the way the proposal is put forward. Can I get closer? I have sat on the AOMB board, um, although I've not discussed this at all in any meetings. Um, my question really relates to NPPF and paragraph 177, which is talking about um, considering applications for development within areas of outstanding natural beauty amongst other places. It says permission should be refused for major development other than in exceptional circumstances and where it can be demonstrated that the development is in the public interest. Um, I, th I think we've established that it, there could be public interest in this and it, 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 there is a need for, for such a site. But what are the exceptional circumstances other than that need? Because the two things are complementary can't just pick one without the other. Um, and what other sites have been looked at in detail? I mean, if you look at the map, then there's, there's areas south of Blanford, outside of the AOMB, that could equally be used, as far as I can tell from a simple map. Thank you. Uh, before I bring in the officers there, I, I think your second part of the question, I think, was already answered earlier about the waste plan going through a long process and various various sites being identified and I don't think there's any proposal of the pipeline to re rejig the whole of the waste management plan. Um, I understand the question but I think uh, unless Mike or Sari want to add to that and then back to the other point that uh, Councillor Took made in the first part of his question. Yeah it, it, I, I think it's along the lines of exactly what you said Chairman. Um, the the, the exceptional test would also have to be considered as part of the allocation process of the local plan so the inspector would have had to have been satisfied that there was an exceptional justification for for the facility part of that is tied into the the locality of of the need as well because some waste facilities are more strategic in the, and, and more footloose i suppose in terms of where they can go others particularly when it comes to household recycling have a more specific requirement to be nearer to where people are going to use it, otherwise you're going to be generating trips all over the place. So the, the element of need um, in the locality was considered as part of that process of looking at whether or not there were alternative sites. And during the, during the Waste Local Plan, there were a number of different opportunities or options that were considered, including making use of existing site, which found that you couldn't actually develop a, more, a modern fit-for-purpose facility in, in those other locations 
um, or, or without going into the AOMV somewhere else and potentially a more sensitive location. This one being right next to Sunrise Business Park and on the bypass ticked quite a few boxes as far as that was concerned. Notwithstanding, there are still some impacts, but that, that was part of the consideration of that process. As part of this application, there's still an, on, uh, an onus on, on the planning authority to look at whether or not appropriate mechanisms are being put in place to minimize or mitigate any outstanding impacts that occur on the landscape. But notwithstanding that, the principle was considered and the alternative options were looked at through that local plan process. Thank you. Okay, Councillor Took, you've got an answer there. Thank you, which I think was very thorough. Thank you, Chair. Um, I take the point. Um, still not necessarily convinced that this is the best place. But I, if, if we've spent 10 years looking at it, maybe we won't spend another 10. Well, we do have the debate coming up, so I'm still covering questions, but thank you for that. And last but not least on my list here is the Vice Chairman, Councillor John Worth. Thank you, Chairman. Um, the only thing I would like to come back on is a point that was raised by Councillor Member Woodhouse with regard to the solar panels. I find it disappointing that these aren't going to be installed from day one um, when we're trying to look at sustainable um, electricity supplies and things like that. I would have thought this would have been an ideal opportunity to put in a system that would provide most of the power for that site, especially if we had a battery storage facility. Um, and I think you mentioned that it was something to do with the steel work for the roof. Surely, if you're going to do that retrospectively, that would be considerably more cost if you're going to beef up um, the roof structure. It seems a bit short-sighted not to do that from day one, but... Um, I suppose there are budgetary restraints, but it does seem a bit short-sighted. Thank you. Thank you. It was just, um, that was to do with the transfer building, and I, I believe, um, I mean, it may be, we could ask the applicant, but I believe that that has ruled out putting those panels on the transfer barn, so those steel elements wouldn't be installed at a later date. What could be installed at a later date is panels on the, the office, the storage building, and the canopy. Um, but unfortunately, that hasn't formed part of this application at this stage. Okay, uh, right, I think we've covered the questions quite thoroughly there, so we're now moving to the debate, and before we start that, um, two things to help us here, when you want to speak, would you be kind enough to raise your hand, that would help us, uh, and when you are asked to speak, if, again, you could introduce yourself, and one thing on the technical matters, uh, these microphones actually don't bite. They are a bit scary, but they don't bite. And you can actually move them down. They don't recommend moving them on the desk, but they, do, they are flexible enough to bring down for perhaps a slightly better volume when you are speaking. Uh, if you wish to stand, feel free to stand, but otherwise we're happy for you to sit and maybe bend the microphone to suit. Okay, so that's a bit of housekeeping there for you. Uh, debate. Anybody want to open this up now? Councillor Brenton. Thank you, Chair. Um, do I have to introduce myself again? I'm me. Okay. Um, this is, I'm speaking now as someone who sort of drives around this bypass quite regularly um, and has got caught in jams in the middle of Blandford waiting for the facility and lorries to unload and such like. So from my point of view, I can see that there is a screaming need for uh, this facility, a facility like this, whatever, uh, in Blandford. Blandford has had a lot of new housing in the last 10 years, and it's having more. Um, and those houses are dinky enough that they're not all going to have a massive bonfire or compost heap in the back garden. They will be using um, household recycling centres. I am concerned that this particular proposal sort of ignores the fact that we're trying to push people out of cars and I would have thought a way of getting workers to the site without them having to drive would be really important. 
I haven't actually checked whether or not the bus goes past and stops, or if there's a bus stop nearby. We should be thinking in terms of how our workers get to work. And I am concerned that, you know, we're pushing more and more people, and a lot of them young, young families who are quite eco-minded up in Gurkha Road at the top there. We've also got the Wyatt's um, development, which will be happening. Um, this site, even though it is in the AONB, is actually also more and more now part of Blandford. We used to think that the other side of the Blandford, uh, the other side of the bypass was no longer there. Sadly, that's not sort of what happens in Blandford. The houses are drifting out from inside the bypass anyway. So I think this is a, quite a useful site, as in it's nearby, but not too far. It's nicely designed. I like the idea. I am slightly worried by this idea that you should plant more and more and more trees there. Actually, the attenuation ponds will be a very useful wildlife resource in their own right. And if you overcrowd trees by removing the ponds and planting trees there instead, you are actually going to sort of overcrowd the trees and they won't thrive. Because remember, we're in an AONB and this is fine, brashy, chalky soil which drains very well. So those trees are going to suffer unless there is a way of watering them regularly. And I am worried about this idea of you build a bank and you plant trees on top of it. In my experience as a tree planter, that is not particularly good for tree establishment. Down on a boggy spot, far, fine. Up on the top of the hill, they're going to dry out. So what does concern me, um, in a way, is Councillor Ridout's point that there's no rainwater harvesting. We have a fire suppressant unit up there. So where are they going to get their water from? Why on earth don't they just collect the rainwater? And having an attenuation pond outside the front is at least, I suppose, another resource. So despite my, what's the word, um, reservations about not linking this in to the modern way of life, which should in future include walking and cycling more, I am in favor of this, I think, and I would like to propose acceptance of this um, application. Okay, thank you. Trees on the hill, by the way, is nothing unusual. I mean, how long's Colmer's Hill been there? Anybody want to comment on? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for your uh, proposal. Uh, is it as recommended with the amended conditions, e.g. on the lighting, etc., that we've seen there? Uh, yeah, that's what you're proposing. Okay. Did, did we want to have a response to anything from, from here, the officers, about what they... Yeah, I mean, thank you, Chairman. I mean, just to comment on, I, I mean, I do note the point. So, I mean, the issue of, of uh, solar panels, of uh, rainwater harvesting, these are all things that I think we're, we're seeing much more interest in actually developing and bringing forward. It's not the sort of thing, unfortunately, that we can consider if it's not part of the current planning application. And therefore, the question is, can we, could we refuse it on those grounds? And, and I think the simple answer from our point of view is we couldn't advise you to do that. Um, this is one of the things, talking of the climate emergency, just as a broader context, it is some work that we are looking to do and bring forward with the council uh, on a, a more proactive basis as to what sort of policy tools we can use. We are currently using the, the, the planning framework as, as stands before us, and that's the basis un, under which we, we consider applications. But at the same time, applicants have a right to expect their applications to be determined within a, a framework that exists at the moment. But it is, it is work that we are actively now starting to, to develop. And when we get to a point where we have more robust policy framework that have teeth, then I think we can start to use that as a means of negotiating on applications and expecting that to come forward as part of that. But I think ultimately we have to consider each application on its merits as it comes before us and whether or not it's con consistent with the plans and policies we have at the moment. Thank you. And can I just ask from the chair, uh, Steve from Highways, um, I know this came up during questions about the uh, access that Councillor Brenton mentioned. 
I mean, would this be something we would consider going forward? I mean, not access on foot or by bike for people taking their waste, obviously, but uh, for employees, etc., uh, would that be something we would monitor going forward from the highways perspective? I think the, um, the honest answer here, Chair, is that the, the closest bus stop, as far as I'm aware, is Lidl's just down the road from here, approximately 150 metres away. And it suffers the vagaries of any rural bus service, unfortunately, in that it probably isn't going to be available when the members of staff are going to want to be starting early or ending their shifts in late patterns. And as I alluded to earlier, I don't think we should be encouraging anybody to cross the bypass, let alone when it's outside uh, daylight hours, if you like. Um, I think it's a good endeavour to look to the future to provide cycle parking facilities and I think that's the best we're ever going to be able to achieve here. We've got to bear in mind the location of the site is on the edge of the bypass. It, it is rem remote from local dwellings as such. So my hope would be that when we get the footbridge in operation and it's utilised for the adjacent development, obviously people who live to the south, i.e. the majority of Blandford, would be able to utilise it if they so desired, and it would operate as a cycleway as well. But more importantly, if and when Wyatt's get an approval for their land to the east, then there will be a link through from that development across Salisbury Road into this site from the school. Now, whether the Dorset Waste would then consider that they wanted pedestrians coming through from that route is a matter to be determined in the future. Um, there is no provision in the current application for that. And it certainly isn't a reason for us to uh, recommend a highway safety refusal in terms of the MPPF, because as a highway authority, we're looking for the definition of the word severe, and I don't feel the fact that they haven't provided pedestrian access is a severe uh, reason that we could recommend a refusal. Thank you, Chair. Well, I know it's most helpful. Thank you. Right, well, we've got uh, Alex Brenton. Councillor Brenton has made a proposal that we grant uh, based on as shown there with the conditions revised as shown. Do I have a seconder? Councillor Jesperson, are you happy to second? As shown with the conditions. Can I make a, a point? I was going to speak, can I make a point or two and then second? Thank you, Mr Chairman. Um, so yes, the, the, um, the need for this facility for the residents um, of North Dorset, that case has been very well made and it, it's very convincing. So the public benefit is very clear. Uh, the choice of this site in the AONB, about which, let's be honest, none of us are very comfortable, um, I, I think I'm satisfied that this is the best site that, that we can find, that the necessary um, uh, uh, tests have been done and therefore I'm satisfied, I think, that this is the right site. Um, so therefore, what, what I'm, con I'm left with is that we have to ensure then, as um, Richard Burton, as uh, uh, our colleague said um, from Dorset AONB, Mr Burden, that we've made this application the least intrusive it can be into the AONB, and that we've, max we've minimised the impacts on the... Um, AONB and the surrounding area. We've discussed tree planting. I, I'm, I'm, I think I'm satisfied on that one, though time will tell. I'm left with lighting. I'm not sure what the justification from the applicant is for not reducing, shortening the timing on the, the, the um, uh, motion triggered lighting from 10 to 5 minutes which would help reduce the impact of the lighting um, in, in the dark skies area. You, we can always put it back up again, but if it starts off at 10 minutes, it's never going to be five. So I, I would be keen to explore what, before I second this, if there's a possibility of firming up that condition and actually this, and starting with five on the understanding that if five turns out to be not enough, you can always go to 10 but we're never going in the other direction. Can, can I just ask that question first and possibly alter that condition, thanks. Yeah, I think that's a reasonable question. Um, yeah, so the, like I say, the condition at the moment says a maximum of, of 10 minutes um, on time, if you like. Um, and having discussed that with the applicant, the reason was that some, 
some of the lights, particularly on the front, front, if you like, of the transfer facility may need longer than five minutes because if a member of staff at the end of the day is crossing the HRC yard there and back, they obviously don't want the light to go out and you know, tip over or anything like that. And so that was the reason why 10 minutes was preferred by them. Although, um, as I said, they have confirmed that they could look at each individual light as they prepare that detailed scheme and some may be able to be five minutes, as, as you say. Um, I think we could, we could tweak the condition. Um, it's actually one, there's actually an amendment proposed to it already, but that's why I've got it on a sheet here. <laughs> Um, the last um, sort of bullet point in that condition was maximum motion sensor on time of 10 minutes after activa activation. I'm just trying to think if you preferred it to be five minutes, but with some flexibility how that would be worded, because we obviously couldn't say maximum five minutes because that would preclude anything more than that. Um, but whether we could come up with some form of wording, perhaps we could have a think about something along the lines of wherever possible, it could be from five minutes maybe. Yeah, the details are to be submitted, yeah. Yeah, sorry, yeah, that, I mean, that, that seems sensible. We, we could have a, I, I would have thought we could have the condition, well, not thinking, I'm thinking on my feet. It could be along the lines of generally five minutes unless otherwise agreed in writing with the local planning authority because that would allow through, because the details have to be submitted to us. So we could almost do it so that we're, the expectation is five minutes, but we would adjust it according to the need. If there was an operational need for it to be slightly longer, we could actually agree that uh, as part of that lighting scheme. I would be very happy with that. That's a very helpful response. So if I could, um, uh, I'd be happy to second it and pr with that um, slightly amended condition in addition to the other amended conditions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. If, if the proposer is happy with that and with my newly amended condition. Okay, well, uh, thank you. Thank you, Mike, for, for just pointing that one out because uh, you're right, the, the, it could be agreed in writing going forward. Otherwise, if it's a change to condition, it would have to come back as a planning application in the future, I think. Yeah, just to, I've, I, just to clarify, I, I've sort of, I said, unless agreed, I, I forgot to mention that we, we ought not to be using unless agreed in writing as a, as a term and not, so I think we'll have to think about the wording in a, in a slightly more robust way, but it would be along the lines of, the, the, the detailed scheme generally might be that it would be five minutes, but, but the, the actual scheme has still got to come to us, so we would agree that overall package with the details, so unless, unless there's an operational need for it to be longer, so that, that would be the way we would do it. So we'd effectively do it on the basis of the five minutes, subject to operational requirements, which would be agreed as part of the scheme that would be submitted to us. Perhaps we'd be, deal with it that way. So if you're happy for us to come up with something along those lines. Very happy to leave it to officers to come up with uh, wording along those lines if the rest of the committee are happy with that. That's, that addresses my concern nicely. Thank you. The proposer, are you happy with that slight amendment to the timing? Yes, I mean, I just think five minutes, you'd end up having multiples of five minutes if necessary. So I think it's sort of just an, a nice add-on, but I'm perfectly happy with it in the proposal. Okay, well, we've got a proposer uh, and a seconder, but before we move to any vote, I did see another hand or two come up. I think, um, Councillor Dunseith, did you want to speak? Yes, thank you, Chairman. It's actually going back to the PV, um, the solar panels that have already been mentioned twice by colleagues. Um, I noticed that they say the, they can't be used on the transfer for barn, these PV installations. They've been discounted because of overshadowing of the parapet walls. And yet that's how it's been designed. They've put in this um, shallow pitched roof and it's hidden behind a parapet wall that has a finished level just above the edge line of the roof. So this is how it's actually been designed. And they're saying, well, they can't do solar panels 
because of the way it's being designed. I get the steel aspect as well. But when I look out of my kitchen window, I can just see the top of a waste transfer station. And as I'm speaking now, it is being retrofitted with PV panels right here, right now. So I don't know, I really can't get why this has been designed so that, so that PV panels cannot be put onto the roof of the barn at a later date. Although I do accept that they have sort of designed the reuse building, which is a much, much smaller roof, but they, they, they are showing a few solar panels on that. But I just don't understand it. They've designed it out. And yet I'm looking and watching solar panels being put on top of a waste transfer station now. Thank you, Chairman. Any further comment? I know this came up at an earlier stage about these, and uh, I think budgetary constraints came into it as well, didn't they? As part of the inquiry. Um, just that the, the transfer barn building has been designed, I believe, in that way to minimise as far as possible that impact on the A and B. So that is why the roof is is at sort of angle. Um, yeah, and obviously the other thing is just that it's not part of the proposal at the moment. So, yeah, that's all I can say, really. Councillor David Took. Thank you, Chair. I think I agree very much with Councillor de I think for the, for the, the building was to be designed so that they cannot carry PV panels seems to me to be a, a, a big oversight. Um, am I correct in saying that given that we are presented with a design as part of this planning application, the way to get that redesigned would be to refuse this application and then have another one brought forward with a far better design enabling PV panels. Am I, am I correct in that? Who wants to answer that comment? Um, so if, if you did want a different design, then in this case, you can't actually <laughs> refuse it. You would have to defer because it's a council development. Um, it makes it a slightly different situation. Um, but if you did want a change to the design, then that would have to be relooked at again. But whether that could be achieved um, and not increase the impact on the A and B. I, I just don't know at, at this stage for a reason. If you could, if you could just give people a wave. Yes, yeah, sorry. Um, we're we just we're just saying that the because the, it's a scheme that's before us at the moment, so we have to determine it on the basis of what's before us. So if you if you don't decide if you think this is unacceptable on those grounds because of impact. Then, then we would have to come up with it. A fresh scheme would have to come in. That's basically that's that's where we stand with that. Yeah, that that's understood. Yeah, Councillor Show Jesperson. Thank you, Chairman. Um, as I understand it, the reason I th I think I have understood I've read in the report and have understood you to say that the reason that this roof has been de designed in this way is to mitigate the impact on the um, AONB. So um, we are balancing um, two, uh, two good things, mitigating the impact on the, on the AONB and um, against solar panels. Could you just clarify for me the, what you did with this roof and why the roof came out in that way to how that is mitigating the impact on the AONB? Because while I'm very sympathetic to the point that's being made about solar panels, I'm also very concerned that of our, uh, with our responsibility to make this 
um, the least intrusive that it can be in the AONB, and I'm um, looking at those two things. Um, as I understand it, the, the building has been designed to minimise impact on the AOMB. I don't know um, what, what would, if, if, we, if, if you wanted um, an amendment, I don't know what the roof would need to be like to support PV panels. I don't know how much change that would be, and I don't know what the implication of that would be, I'm afraid. Um, I'm only looking at what what is in front of us, so I can't really, I, I, I can't really answer that very well, I'm afraid. Um, <laughs> I don't know if anyone's got any comments. Uh, I'm going to ask uh, Phil from Legal just to say, say something on this one, please. Thank you, Chairman. Um, just to add to um, what Mike and Sarah have said on, on the design point of view, um, you had the proposal before you, you need, if you were minded to refuse on design grounds, it would have to be that the design was so unacceptable without the solar panels that it, it wasn't acceptable in, in planning terms. So that, that would be the basis for you, that you would have to have to refuse a, an application on that, those grounds. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Councillor Rideout, you wanted to say something? Thank you, Chairman. Having brought up about the solar panels in the first place, I think actually we need to forget about solar panels going on the transfer station because obviously it was designed in a way to have less impact on the A1B, and I fully understand that. But as Sarah's already explained, there's other buildings, there's also the HRC canopy that could possibly have them. So I think we need <coughs> to forget about them and concentrate on the application. Thank you. Yes, it's a question of balance, as in many of these cases, striking the right balance between getting what is right or what is acceptable in that location and what other things need to, what, what other add-ons go with it. Council, I'm going to give you one more go and then we're going to go to the vote. Thank you. Thank you. Um, when the council passed its Climate and Ecological Emergency Notice, the very first when the council passed its climate and ecological emergency motion um, as one of the very first acts it did then i think we we need to to take solar panels very much into concern i don't think we can't just forget them that the, the whole thing should have been designed and the policy of this council is to design things in a way that is consistent with that climate and ecological emergency so I'm afraid I, I'm, I'm not convinced that uh, that design is good enough um, and I, I, I won't be supporting it. Thank you. Okay. Um, just very, uh, one other thing there. I noticed a, a note was passed to, um, from uh, uh, Lady Speaker to Council Jesperson. Okay, all right, thank you. No, that's fine. My legal advisor tells me that's absolutely fine. Thank you. Uh, okay, look, um, no more speakers. We're going to move to the vote. We've got a proposer, Councillor Alex Brenton, has proposed it, uh, as shown there, with amendments to the conditions. And it's been seconded by Councillor Sherry Jesperson. And uh, show of hands, please. Uh, so all those in favour, please show. Okay, thank you. And against? Thank you. A any abstentions? Well, I make that uh, eight, four, yes, eight. We've got eight in favour of the proposal as uh, recommended with the amendments to conditions and one against. So that is now passed. Thank you very much. Thank you for that discussion. Quite interesting and informative as well. Thank you for your presentation. Moving on, item uh, six, urgent, urgent items. I don't think there are any urgent items. No? 
And uh, item seven, exempt business. No exempt business, I'm pleased to say. So on that note at um, 11.50, just a, a thank you to everybody involved here. I mean, this is a first for me sitting up here and doing this meeting this way instead of sitting at home and uh, being able to nip out for a cup of coffee very quickly afterwards. But it's been an interesting experience. And thank you, everybody, for that's participated. And thank you to our speakers as well for their contribution. So on that note, I declare the meeting closed. Thank you. <laughs>